Hello, BookTube. I once again had to go out very, very early this morning and ended up in downtown Boston uh, in the very early morning hours. It's gusting wind. It was quite chilly. Uh, and I ended up in the uh, area of the Brattle Bookshop, uh, one of my favorite places to go in the entire world, a used bookstore in Boston that has a gigantic sale lot of books outside. Hence my complaining about the weather. I did not get to retreat into the store as you do in a normal bookstore because the, the main shopping that I do is in the Brattle is outside. Uh, but I figured there's, there, it looks like there's a dusting of snow coming tomorrow, perhaps. Tomorrow will probably be inclement weather. Even if it's just rain, the, the, the outdoor carts will be covered over or moved back inside. So I wouldn't be able to do it then. Uh, and I felt like a pick-me-up. So I went to the Brattle Bookshop uh, and I found a stack of books. And I wanted to show them to you. And there's a theme for most of them. And the theme is March Mystery Madness, which is a big booktube event that, uh, for which I am one of the co-hosts, uh, where we, for the whole month of March, celebrate murder mysteries all month long in all of their different uh, iterations, everything that you could think about them, whatever you love about murder mysteries, or maybe want to love, or maybe learn more about, try a different kind of murder mystery. The theme uh, this time around is two by two. But that's so intentionally elastic that you could use it for pretty much anything. You could even just say, you're doing this in the year 2022. That's two by two right there. Uh, but the the Brattle uh, last year got a gigantic shipment. And they went out on a huge buy and got a huge amount of murder mysteries. Looks like a great number of them came from the same person. Maybe all of them did. Uh, they're all of them carefully mylar for with coverings over the dust jackets. And a lot of them are signed. With, and the signage is the same... Uh, label on the spine. I'm thinking they probably all came from the same person. That's always a little bit saddening to think about because who gives that up voluntarily? They're probably dead. Uh, but I have been picking and pecking at that gigantic murder ship, murder mystery shipment for a long time. It's now on its way out. Now that the, the Brattle just did a, a huge shipment of art books and that, that is on its way in. Uh, but since these things are a dollar a piece, you can take chances. You can do all sorts of experimentation. And uh, I had a few dollars and I had an empty shoulder bag, so I indulged myself. And I want to show you all of these things. But most of them are shots in the dark. Most of them I know nothing about at all. I just, they, it was nothing at all to experiment and they intrigued me for one reason or another. But not the first one. The first one is something that I know well. I've had copies of it before, and it has been a kind of a holy grail for me. It has been a kind of thing I've been really hoping that I would find at the Brattle or somewhere else, uh, because it's referenced all the time when it comes to murder mysteries. Uh, and it's this. It's a nonfiction work by Colin, Colin Watson called Snobbery with Violence. I finally found a paperback copy from Mysterious Press. Now, this isn't made well. It's not going to hold together very well. But this is a nonfiction study about who reads murder mysteries, what kinds of groups murder mysteries fall into uh it's just uh, I, I read it from a library a long time ago and wanted a copy i've wanted a copy all along and i still do i actually want this in a hardcover with a dust jacket i'm not i'll take this for now definitely but i'm going to want to rip this to shreds and i know i know that it's not going to hold up to that kind of a reading i'll find it i'll find it in hardcover eventually but at least now i have it and I can reread the, the pertinent parts from March Mystery Madness. Because in March every year when Booktube talks about all things mystery, I like to read not only lots and lots of murder mysteries. I'm going to read everything that I got today, this month. Uh, I like to read not only lots and lots of murder mysteries, but also uh, tractates about mysteries. Uh, why we read them, what groups they fall into, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and Snobby with Violence is one of the best regarded of those studies that I know of, and uh, one of the only ones that I don't have, so glad I found it. Uh, then this next one, I absolutely could not resist this next one. I, I pulled it out, looked at the cover, and thought, well, I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> this is by Stuart Kaminsky, who's a, a hack writer that I know, I know his work well. I know that I won't be displeased by how this is done. And this is, this is a Toby Peters mystery, and it's called The Man Who Shot Lewis Vance. And if you're thinking, you, you cinephiles that might be thinking, that sounds a lot like The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. That title reminds me of the great Western, one of the great Westerns of all time. Uh, the Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Of course, they can't possibly be connected. <laughs> it's because they are. They are connected. That's why it's titled this. <laughs> that 
<laughs> that is John Wayne. <laughs> the book is features John Wayne as a character. Toby Peters, private investigator, awakens one Sunday to find himself in a flea bag L.A. hotel. The warm corpse of one of Lewis Van of one Lewis Vance beside him, and John Wayne pointing a thirty-eight caliber revolver between his eyes. It has not been a good weekend. <laughs> After some fast talking with the Duke, Toby and the hotel Dick merit straight ahead Beeson identify the killer, who confesses to having tried to involve Wayne in a publicity seeking scandal. The case is closed until Beeson winds up shot and someone starts taking target practice at the Duke. <laughs> So it, it's called The Man Who Shot Louis Vance, and it's it's one of the main characters. Maybe even, God help us all, one of the sleuthing characters will be John Wayne himself. <laughs> so, it's, it's not a long thing. It's an hour's reading, but I couldn't pass it up, could you? <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, then this next one, I confess, I noticed the... Uh, the furry creature on the cover and that piqued my interest and then i read it this is the asking price by john buxton hilton i don't think i know this author and there's a little mouse on the cover and apparently one of the characters in the book hates mice uh kenworthy in retirement is consulted by a special team operating from the cabinet office so this is a superintendent kenworthy novel and i guess he's retired when the novel starts uh they need his second opinion on the random kidnapping of a motley collection of customers from a village shop in Bedfordshire. The ransom price is so bizarre that it, ha that it is kept secret from the public, and on their return, the villagers seem none the worse for their experience. But a rougher time is had by all when an entire Norfolk Parish Council is spirited away. Not until they try their hand at abducting a Yorkshire branch of the Women's Institute do the kidnappers meet their, meet their match. From a series of memorable vignettes, there emerges a sardonic picture of England in the 1980s. That's what sold me. I will definitely try that. 40 years ago. Uh, a small-time London thief who does not like mice. His anarchistic daughter on the brink of a doctorate in criminology. A corrupt tycoon who tires of monopoly in an open prison. Two intelligent young policemen struggling to interpret a tachometer tach log. John Buxton Hilton is here operating in a new vein. He insists that he never wants to write the same book twice, but for readers, the asking price generated by this title may well prove to be more of the same. Uh, we shall see. Again, it's an hour's read, so I'm perfectly happy to give it a try. Uh, then I indulge myself for a few uh, historicals. My favorite, obviously, predictably enough, my favorite kind of murder mystery is historical murder mystery, so I indulge myself without knowing anything about these. They're a dollar a piece. I, you know, I can, I can get rid of them as easily as I got them. I don't like them. And if I do, I've made a new find and maybe a whole series of stuff. Uh, so the first one is by Philip Gooden. This is the Alms for Oblivion. It's called a Shakespearean murder mystery. It's obviously not Shakespeare on the cover. <laughs> but uh, I didn't notice from a quick glance at the plot much presence of Shakespeare. But let's see. Uh, on a foggy morning in the autumn of 1602, a boyhood friend of Nick Revels arrives in London. And when Peter Agate announces that he intends to try his hand at acting, what else can Nick do but invite him to join his own troupe, the Chamberlain's Company, who are about to put on a private production of Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida for the lawyers of the Middle Temple? Yet within days, Peter Agate is found dead, stabbed to death at Nick's lodgings, and this is only the beginning of a sequence of violent events, each of them somehow implicating Nick and pulling the hangman's noose ever tighter around his neck. To save himself, Nick must discover the real murderer among a varied cast of suspects, including an aristocratic and eccentric brother and sister, uh, the troublemaker from a rival company, and an ex-actor who once saw the devil himself on stage. So one of those characters will be Shakespeare, I'm sure. <laughs> and I think I have a suspicion that uh, that Philip Sidney, that, that I have a suspicion I can guess who a couple of these other characters will be. But I've never heard of this before. I've never read it. It's one of these 80 million hardcover mystery novels that come and go. Nobody ever hears them again. Uh, this one, I think, this next one is uh, part of the series, but I don't think I've ever heard of it, so I'm, I'll be encountering it for the first time. And I think this, uh, pretty sure this, that this cover is a UK edition. It looks really nice, and it has uh, price in pounds on the cover. This is by James McGee, and it's Resurrectionist. And the, sub the description here is, You don't send a gentleman to catch vermin. You send Hawkwood. I presume that is Hawkwood on the cover. Uh, and I assume from that that this is not the first book in a series, that this is character is well known to its readership. Uh, and now you've got the London of the time period uh, on the end papers there. You see the, 
He's, the owner of this took took care to to cover it up and make sure that it was neatly preserved, and also put the signed signature on all of these. Uh, what this is also historical. Uh, a new term at London's anatomy school stokes demands for fresh corpses, and the city's resurrection men vie for control of the market. Their rivalry takes an ugly turn when a grave robber is brutally murdered and his body displayed as a warning to other gangs. To hunt down those responsible, Hawkwood must venture into London's murkiest corners, where ever more gruesome discoveries await him. So what do we know? Uh, uh, okay, he's a Bow Street runner. And what, what would be the time period of this thing? Okay, you, the, the map tells me this is Hawkwood's London. Oh, this is signed by the author. Look at that. Uh, uh, signed by the author, but when? When does this take place? Oh, you, the text doesn't tell me. Uh, no, okay, the text doesn't tell me. The back cover has all sorts of UK blurbs, including one from the great Reginald Hill. Uh... Okay, that's great. Well, I, uh, okay, Resurrectionist is the second thriller featuring Matthew Hawkwood. The first one is called Ratcatcher. So for all I know, Ratcatcher was at the battle and I just missed it. But I'm perfectly happy to start with the second one. Perfectly happy to give this a try. Uh, then we have an oddity. This is, this is uh, not the first murder mystery set around this particular mystery. And this is, as far as historical mysteries goes, this is a doozy. Although I myself have never understood why people think there's a mystery involved in this story. This book is by Emma Darwin, and the book is called A Secret Alchemy. A little bit of a little bit of an ugly cover, but I think this is this is UK as well. And uh, yeah, it must be because it's got only UK blurbs on the back, except for the Washington Post. Uh, the all blurbs for the mathematics of love. But this this isn't about just any mystery. It's about the princes in the tower. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, some sort of some sort of paperwork in there. I don't really want that. Let's see here. Uh, two murdered princes, a powerful queen betrayed, a nobleman riding toward his certain death. The story of the princes in the tower has been one of the most fascinating and most brutal murder mysteries in history for more than 500 years. Uh, in a brilliant feat of historical daring, Emma Darwin has recreated the terrible, exhilarating world of the two youngest victims of the Wars of the Roses. The power struggles and passions that lay behind their birth, the danger into which they fell, the profoundly moving days before their imprisonment, and the ultimate betrayal of their innocence. In this book, three voices speak, that of Elizabeth Woodville, the beautiful widow of King Edward IV, of her brother Anthony, surrogate father to the doomed Prince Edward and his younger brother Dickon, uh, and that of present-day historian Una Pryor, Orphaned and herself brought up in a family where secrets and rivalries threaten her world, Una's experience of tragedy, betrayal, and lost love help her unlock the long-buried secrets that led to the prince's death. So this, will, this is ultimately a Princes in the Tower murder mystery, just like The Daughter of Time by Josephine Tay. Uh, whether it comes, to, I've never heard of this before, whether it comes to the same conclusions as The Daughter of Time, I have no idea. I've never understood why the death of the Princes in the Tower is considered a mystery? <laughs> I really don't. Considering that the man who stood to benefit, the man who stood to become king, if they both died, had a long track record of being in the right place at the right time to benefit from murders. And so, is probably guilty of those murders. In, in, when it comes, just in case you're ever plotting to take over the English throne, or, or know someone who is, when it comes to monarchical uh, maneuvering, Unless a comet falls from the sky with bright letters on it pointing at someone else, the person who inherits the throne is guilty. <laughs> unless that happens, unless God himself points a finger at a wall and, scri and scribes out, it was Lindbergh. <laughs> unless that's true, the person who takes the throne killed to get it. <laughs> okay, can we just be clear on that? I would argue that that uh, Richard was guilty of the death of many different people in the royal line, and that these two constituted his third or maybe even fourth dead kings. Because <laughs> keep in mind, my own pet theory is that uh, uh, when the older of the two princes, Edward, knew that they were being murdered, that murderers had entered their room, at the obvious behest of their uncle, that when he knew that, 
he would have tried to protect his younger brother, which means he would have died first. And when he died, his younger brother became king and then was killed. <laughs> so, so I would argue that, that these two are just the latest in a gigantic body count from Richard. And I think this ample historical evidence to prove that if if you hear hoofbeats as the medical school inference goes don't think zebras the guy who inherited the throne if he inherited it over a dead body he caused that body to be dead <laughs> but i'll be still be interested in what emma darwin has to say on the subject we'll see if she's secretly a ricardian there, there, he, he he makes even academics and sober people fall in love with him no idea why i think it's josephine tay uh this next one i remember i i uh tried this when it first came out. And I remember really liking it. Very un unconventional murder mystery. Police procedural, that sort of thing. This is by Charles Stanley, and it's called A Carrion Death. And it introduces Detective Kubu. Kubu is a nickname. Uh, smashed skull, snapped ribs, and cloying smell of carrion. Leave the body for the hyenas to devour. No body, no case. And the hyenas will. They'll eat it all. <laughs> if they don't get driven off by lions, they'll eat it all. Even the bones. Hyena scat on the open savanna is easy to spot because it can be chalky white. They eat bones. <laughs> so, uh, when, but when Kalahari game rangers stumble on a human corpse mid-meal, it turns out the murder wasn't perfect after all. Enough evidence is left to suggest foul play. Detective David Kubu Bengu of the Botswana Criminal Investigation Department is assigned to the case. The detective's personality and physique match his moniker. The nickname Kubu is Setswana for Hippopotamus. A seemingly docile creature, but one of the deadliest on the continent. I can certainly attest to that. They are always in a bad mood, unlike elephants, unlike rhinos even. And, oh God, are they fast. <laughs> uh, but anyway, beneath Kubu's pleasant surface lies the same unwavering resolve that makes the hippopotamus so deceptively dangerous. Both will trample everything in their path to reach an objective. I'm, I don't know how long this series went on. I don't think it's still going on. But I read this first one and really liked it. And I, I think about it often. There are a couple of scenes in here that I think about often. Uh, so I was overjoyed to find it for, for a dollar in, in a dust jacket with a sign, with you know, off the signature. It was, a, it was good hunting. Again, the only melancholy element is that somebody doesn't have these books because I do. Uh, and then we'll finish up with the only two that weren't murder mystery related. This was mostly a March Mystery Madness battle trip. Uh, but I found two that are uh, a little bit closer to my to my uh, bailiwick. Uh, the first one is by David Donachi. It's called A Flag of Truce. Uh, the, the, the legend on the, on the cover goes, Firebrand John Pierce returns in this latest adventure on the high seas. It's a Napoleonic seafaring adventure novel, part of a series, I guess. Don't think this series ever came out in America. Uh, and this one is signed, and it the uh, the Toulon blockade, I believe, uh, September of 1793. Firebrand John Pierce has come a long way since he was illegally press ganged into King George's navy. Promoted to lieutenant at the king's behest in recognition of his earlier exploits, he is in a position to command uh, of command on board the HMS Farron, where he returns to Toulon from his successful mission in Corsica. So you get a recurring Hornblower-esque character in this series. I don't think I've ever read any of the books in this series, and I don't know how long it is, but for a dollar? I was happy to take it, and we'll see. I'm, I've, I've lost my heart to quite a few uh, Napoleonic seafaring adventure novels. This could be the latest one. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, well, uh, Snobbery with Violence was the find of the day, even in trade paperback. But boy, oh boy, was I happy to find this. I had a trade paperback of this thing. And trade paperbacks don't hold up to the kind of use that I tend to give them. And today I found a hardcover with a dust jacket with a Mylar dust jacket cover. Perfect condition. This is by George Don, and it's uh, If by Sea. This is his book about the history of the forging of the U.S. Navy. Uh, before, during, and immediately after the American Revolution. This is an author who wrote a great book called 1812, on the War of 1812. A book that... Uh, that uh, superseded uh, the great, the two great books that had come before it as the great book on the War of 1812. Just amazing. This guy really, really crafts a great historical uh, narrative. And this thing is great too. This, and I had the trade paperback and didn't particularly want it. it. Wasn't in love with being gentle with it. You always wear, if a trade paperback falls or if you roll over on it or if somebody rolls over on it, 
you could fold the cover and there's no way to fix that. There's no way to unfold it. The crease will still be there. Hardcovers are much more durable, especially if they're on a subject near and dear to my heart. There's, uh, there's not a character in, I'm sure there's not a character in this book that I don't know backwards and forwards. I, I'm positive. I remember reading. There's not a single naval encounter that's de de detailed in this book that I don't know. Uh, and this goes all the way up to uh, the War of 1812, which he then covers in great depth in a book devoted to that. Uh, so very happy to find this in a in a perfect, you know, a perfect book to put on the shelf. Just great. Uh, so that was it. That was the uh, the Brattle trip for this morning. Maybe pre snow squall. Who knows? A March little snowstorm. Uh, a, a good haul. Mostly March mystery madness. I'll try to remember to leave the hashtag so that my fellow co-hosts at March Mystery Madness don't think that I've completely abandoned them. I have not. I will be making more murder mystery oriented videos. But in the meantime, we have, I don't want to block the bean here. We have If by Sea by George Dowen. This is, uh, these are, he's a fantastic author. This book and his book on 1812 are very much worth your time and money. Uh, then we have uh, A Flag of Truce, David Donacci. We'll see if, if, you know, this intrigues me enough to look for other books in the series. I don't even know how many there are. Uh, a Carry and Death, uh, de uh, uh, the death of someone in Botswana, a very, very different setting, a different kind of world for uh, murder mysteries or police procedurals. Uh, then A Secret Alchemy, a murder mystery series, a uh, murder mystery novel about the princes in the tower. Uh, Resurrectionist by James McGee about the, uh, the body trade. Uh, you couldn't, you couldn't will your body to science, but, but anatomy schools were flourishing and they needed bodies to work on. So people just raid graveyards <laughs> you know if you had a, if you had a, a grilled and gated and locked marble mausoleum you might be safe but uh not otherwise uh then alms for oblivion a shakespearean era and uh murder mystery that may have shakespeare in it the asking price which is an inadvertently historical portrait of 1980s london um i'm sure that it was written in the 1980s but now you look we'll look back on it post everything and see what what it was like and remember what it was like last time i was in london was in the 80s i'm sure i'll never be back so i'm sure it'll bring back memories for me uh then the man who shot lewis vance <laughs> uh, a murder mystery starring the star of the man who shot liberty valance uh, and finally snobbery with violence this is this is a great analysis of murder mysteries not a collection of them just a study of what they are why they are all that sort of thing very very good stuff uh it's going to be aside from maybe the princess in the tower book it's going to be the strongest uh temptation to read <laughs> of this batch uh but anyway that was a brattle trip uh there'll be more <laughs> but in the meantime i will wrap this up and i will see you soon thank you book two